Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. They're polite. I mean, they just take the time for you. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. I like the Angels for what they've done for me. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients. Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching. Thanks as always to the producer and editor of our series, Jeff Durall. We're at Rary Call on the campus of Fort Hayes State University with Associate Professor of History at Fort Hayes State, Dr. David Goodland, as we talk about movies and history. Also songs as well at Dr. Goodland. Now in your 20th year of teaching at Fort Hayes State. Yes, been, been here a while. That's quite a record, Dr. Goodland. Tell me about movies and songs as it relates to history and how the, the integration of movies and songs into your classes came about. Well, uh, uh, movies came first in the sense I started integrating them before I did songs and I do it more with films. I have particular approaches to using songs in it, but uh, first of all, a lot of students uh, and non-students, for that matter, have an understanding of history through watching films, mm -hmm. and therefore I can use the films to highlight certain points, uh, to show certain patterns from one culture to another, because I teach world history, mm -hmm. and also uh, to correct some misimpressions they might have picked up specifically because the movies had them. Uh, and I, I use the example frequently of the movie 300, which is a very entertaining movie um, about the events that lead up to inc and including the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, where the, the Spartans met the Persians. B uh, and I like to point out it's, it is an enjoyable movie, but the Spartans were not wearing modified Speedos, and they did not fly through the air for 15 <laughs> feet at a time, and Xerxes was not 10 feet tall based on any evidence we have. So th I, I don't know whether any of them end up thinking any of that is true, uh, particularly the, uh, the lack of armor, because the Spartans were wearing armor, they, they wanted to live as they could. Uh, and I, th it corrects some misimpressions. The Old West. Mm. Uh, a, a lot of people are under the impression, because movies have had it as a theme since it began as dime novels back in the 1860s and 70s, about wagon trains going across. Uh, and the image of, of them going into a circle with American Indians riding around shooting at them. Well, we don't actually have a single incidence of that happening that we know of. Uh, there were such attacks, but there was no going into a circle. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to have been derived from uh, the uh, m uh, movement of the Afrikaners in South Africa trying to escape British rule. But the climate there was very different. They had water that would come down. They wouldn't run out of water. Mm -hmm. And it, it did happen. They were traveling in wagons frequently. So apparently, at least as far as we can tell, somebody aware of that happening in South Africa mm -hmm. a, few dec a couple of decades earlier decided to <laughs> throw it, it into a novel. Does it bother you, Dr. Goodlett, that uh, movies sometimes take license with the truth? It doesn't bother me at all if it's not trying to tell you this is true. If they just use it for, for entertainment purposes, it doesn't. That's why I still enjoy the movie 300. Uh, sometimes it bothers me a lot as a historian, not necessarily as a film buff, but as a historian, when they are trying to make you think something is true, and I use the, the movie JFK as, a, as an example, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do, because it's a brilliant film. As a film, it's, it's a brilliant film. But uh, the, it presents history, mixing documentary footage with fictional footage. Mm -hmm. It presents it as though it wants you to take seriously this is what led to the Kennedy assassination, the, the President Kennedy assassination, when in fact it combines multiple conspiracy theories simultaneously and it ends up being taken literally silly mm -hmm. because there's no way that happened. <laughs> Even if you believe in a conspiracy theory, you wouldn't take five of them and put them in combination <laughs> all at the same time. But it is, a, so I point out it's a, it's a wonderful film, but you don't want to base your opinion about what happened on the Kennedy, during the Kennedy assassination on that film because it de it's definitely not accurate in many respects. Well, and some that's been part of the criticism, I think, of the blending of fact and fiction 
and the difficulty in the viewer being able to tell the difference. Indeed. Uh, it's, it's, it's partly a question of ethics, not so much aesthetics, <clears throat> but of ethics, because uh, you can mislead very seriously people if they, th they th you see something that's actually footage shot at the time and something else that looks like footage shot at the time but is not, unless you go out of your way to let them know. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there that's actually made up, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, then people can be um, not only misinformed but have their understanding distorted. Uh -huh. You also say that films, back to the original concept, can really transport students to a different time and place that they've not experienced themselves. I, sometimes it's why I recommend a movie when I'm talking about a subject that I know that very few of them have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one movie that now I, I discover the, the small number of people have seen, it's, it's, sometimes I'll have a class with nobody having seen it, is <clears throat> called The Quiet Man with mm -hmm. John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara directed by John Ford uh, because it's one of the probably ten most purely entertaining movies I've ever seen. But it's, act, it's a great way of explaining the concept of dowry when we're discussing the evolution of uh, both uh, hu human beings, relations between men and women, and economics, and how dowry is a much more complicated notion than the average person thinks. And there's confusion between the two main characters in there over what's going on, and that produces the conflict that they have. It's also tremendously funny, and it's, and it's got one of the best and longest lasting fist fights you'll ever see in a movie. <laughs> but, uh, but it actually is a very good example of how complex the idea of dowry is. Anthropologists probably would like that aspect of it very much as well. Well, and it also favors one of your favorite actors, John Wayne. Indeed. Uh, Wayne and, and Cary Grant and Fred Astaire are my three favorite on-screen performers. It, they're, they've all been dead for over 30 years, but uh, the, and I, I tried to figure out once, why do those three actually appeal to me personally? Mm -hmm. Why is it that I enjoy so many of their movies? And I realized, and this is obvious with Fred Astaire, I don't know if it is with the other two, they had a physical grace about them that mm -hmm. the camera loves. Mm -hmm. Now, and Astaire was <laughs> maybe the greatest dancer of the 20th century, mm -hmm. period. Uh, a number of people, uh, ballet dancers have argued that as well about mm -hmm. Astaire, a number of them have. But, so the fact that he is physically graceful is so obvious every second that he's on a screen practically, mm -hmm. especially when he's dancing. But uh, Grant uh, was an acrobat. I mean, he, he, he was uh -huh. a professional acrobat for a while, so he had enormous body control. And Wayne was an, an athlete. He was a mm -hmm. football player. Uh, he just had a couple of problems as an offensive lineman, so he ended up losing his scholarship. But he was very graceful physically. And you don't tend to notice that because he has such an odd walk. Mm -hmm. But all three of them capture your attention when you're looking at them on screen because the way they move is so darn graceful. Mm -hmm. You just don't necessarily, you're not conscious of it. I had to think about it for a long time and watch their movies to figure that out. So yeah, that's why those three are my, my favorites. I have to ask you about a couple of movies that obviously have relationships uh, close to home here, one of which is Wizard of Oz uh, back in the 30s. Talk well, about it. Well, um, as <laughs> in, in fact, obviously, the, the opening and closing of that movie have left, uh, for many people across the United States, their visual image of what Kansas is. Yes. Uh, you, you, that there is beauty in Kansas might not be something the average person would think about mm -hmm. if they've never been here, because it's so Dust Bowl-ish looking. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was actually right after the Dust Bowl, but the way it was shot, it was so stark, mm -hmm. much of it on a, on a soundstage, but it was so stark looking, and the black and white imagery is so stark mm -hmm. looking that People think it's like the moon or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that negative concept has prevailed over yes, the years. Yes, it has. I, I mean, uh, I, I know people f throughout the United States who just immediately you mention Kansas and they go, why would anybody live there? Because they still can't get that image <laughs> yeah. out of their heads. Yeah. Talk about uh, the Paper Moon, the one that was actually shot in this area. Yes, and it's a, it, it's, a, it's a really good film with Ryan O'Neill and... Madeline Kahn and Tatum O'Neill. Um, th there were people in the community who have actually been, who mm -hmm. were actually in the movie, yeah. uh, and there's still a, an awful lot of conversation about it. Uh, it's, it's set during the Depression, too, and the truth is, it probably reinforces the visual image yeah. from The Wizard of Oz as yeah. well, because it's pretty stark looking. Mm -hmm. And again, stark black and white imagery. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about uh, 
the, the need for a professor such as Dr. Goodluck to be able to help the students learn the difference in films, what they see as it relates to history and why that role for the professor is a very important one for them to, to expand their knowledge. Yeah, I wouldn't automatically say it has to be a professor. It has to be somebody with film knowledge who, talking to anyone who has a really broad and deep knowledge of film, the history of film. Uh, they, they can correct that, but in the context in which I operate, I'm dealing with a lot of people simultaneously, mm -hmm. so I can inform people uh, in, a, in larger numbers mm -hmm. about some of the errors. Uh, also, again, it's not just about errors, it's also about um, using it to highlight th certain things in history. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, well, you could bring well, that. I, when I when I discussed uh, the uh, era of medieval Japan, uh, se a separation. No, well, no, that that that's that one uh, it is in a different context. Although it's useful for that. Okay. The the, the medieval Japan, uh, the the what emerged the, as film was being made in Japan in the modern world was a focus on medieval Japan as a as the place where samurai roamed. They were the, the oh. by far uh -huh. they that's where they were. Mm -hmm. They they did exist and they were roving uh, individuals and bands of, uh, of swords for hire, basically. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the Western, and you see that that's very similar to the gunslinger in the Western. Mm -hmm. And the people who make movies in both cultures become aware of that. Uh -huh. so, uh, so each culture ends up influencing each, uh, the other. Uh, the, the number of the Japanese filmmakers who come of age in the, in the 30s and 40s including Akira Kurosawa, who's probably the most famous, and although he began a little earlier than that as well, they will watch John Ford and Howard Hawks directed westerns, mm -hmm. and you can see how they blend that into uh, how you make a samurai movie mm -hmm. in, in a number of ways, visually and a, a, a number of other respects. But then you go back and you look at The Magnificent Seven, an American western, which is a, a remake of Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai, uh -huh. or uh, a Fistful of Dollars, which made Clint Eastwood a movie star, is a remake an, uh, of Kurosawa's Yojimbo. And they, they, each culture influences the other. And when you're teaching a world history class, it's you, and you're constantly trying to show how cultures interact and actually influence each other, that provides a perfect venue for it. Wow. We're uh, nearing Halloween again this year. So we have to talk about horror movies and their influence on us and on society. Well, uh, there's, particularly over the last 30 or 35 years, there's been a whole lot written about it, not all of it scholarship, but a whole lot written about it regardless. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is it, it mirrors what was written about it from earlier periods as well. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the horror movie came of age pretty much at the very end of the 19-teens and the 1920s during the era of silent film, uh, Nosferatu is a, a German film about um, essentially Dracula, mm -hmm. and it provides, any, for anybody who's seen it, and people who make horror movies almost all have seen it, uh, one of the creepiest visual images of a vampire you'll ever see. It still <laughs> really, holds up Really well. creepy. It's an excellent film. You, you, you'll get a lot out of it if you watch it now. Uh, and then there are other uh, horror films made in the 20s. Where American film really picks it up is with uh, the uh, first, well, the first major English language version of the Dracula story, which is called Dracula, with mm -hmm. Bela Lugosi mm -hmm. starring in it. And then the next year, Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. uh, and those two films laid, uh, set the template for the next three or four decades. And you, you had, and, and they were very atmospheric. They weren't very explicit. They didn't have a lot of gore or anything. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're very moody and they're designed using visuals to create mood. Uh, starting especially in the 70s, in the 1970s, we, we had a movement towards more explicit horror films in which you do see a lot more gore. You see all, um, horror mixed with sexuality mm -hmm. and a number of other elements. And, that, and th you have the theme of, of young women being the victims and that mm -hmm. will extremely upset a number a number of people who do analysis of it although it's noticeable that a lot of the people who go see those movies are young women mm -hmm. so there's there's obviously more going on there than is 
than I think on the surface. It, it mirrors uh, people who got it really excited about it, want to have whole congressional hearings on it, things like that, or who wrote articles about it, uh, somewhat mirror the early 1950s congressional investigations of mm. comic books mm -hmm. and the argument that they were they were damaging American youth. So it's not, it's, that wasn't actually that new. Uh, that, that happens as well uh, throughout history. And, it, and in fact, it goes back not just with comic books or horror movies, but films in general to the to the uh, production code that, that they began to enforce in the early 1930s that limit all, almost everything I just said, <laughs> almost all the, mm -hmm. the, the the elements that I just said for several decades. In our final couple of minutes, uh, Dr. Goodlett, give us your take on uh, the psychological horror of the film master Alfred Hitchcock, would you? Uh, yeah, it's, he, he managed to blend horror and suspense more perfectly than anybody else ever has. He's, a, he's an extremely visual director. He would storyboard all of his films uh, and he thought, basically, that's where all the work was. After that, it was just shooting what he had already created storyboards for. Uh, that leaves out a little bit of the writer and, <laughs> and the, the film the scorer and all that, which do matter as well. But Hitchcock had a fantastic visual sense. Uh, he set most of the horror films that I talked about that emerged later are, ba are derived from Psycho, from his movie The Psycho, which. Well, not the Psycho, his movie Psycho, which is a film that just, uh, to this day, I'm, my grandmother was a uh, seven-state representative for one of the largest unions in the United States. And so she traveled constantly. And she saw the movie Psycho, and from that moment on, would never stay in a motel for the rest of her life. She was just oh, terrified oh, oh. of staying in a motel. She would stay only in what were called hotels because mm -hmm. she didn't know if she was going to run into Norman Bates someplace. That, the, the movie had this enormous impact. It, too, was controversial because there were people who argued, oh, this, is, this, is, this could damage people. I, don't, uh -huh. I haven't actually seen any evidence of anybody damaged yet mm -hmm. other than being scared out of their wits. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a smart movie, uh, which is worth noting. We should mention, too, that Dr. Goodland, in addition to being Associate Professor of History at Fort Hay State, has continued his community involvement as we had a chance to connect uh, with that uh, dedication of the Hayes Public Library and their new facility at the library. And now you're still working with the Hayes yeah, Public I, I Library. Yeah, was, I wasn't on the board for a number of years after that, but I'm back on it again, and it's a, a really good board. It, we just hired a new director who is astonishingly impressive, um, Jim Agee, if you if, if for anybody who's listening or watching this, if you haven't met him, stop by the library and see him. He's very, very impressive. We plan to do that for a future community connection. Thanks for your insight, Dr. Goodluck. Very impressive. Dr. David Goodluck, Associate Professor of History at Fort Hayes State, our community connection. Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. And the angel care nurse comes to see me once a week. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. Angel Care has helped to, to stay home. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients.